Yo, it's DJ Burn one, and I just jumped off the porch. The dirty glove bastard. Let me know, know what's up before I grow, grow enough. Yeah. All right, so we got the day one fam, DJ Burn one, jumping off the porch with us today, man. Hey, what up, fam? How y'all doing? Man, I'm feeling great. How you feeling today, man? Man, I'm feeling wonderful, blessed, rejuvenated. Okay. You know, ready to get it, man. Yes, sir, man. No, I appreciate you coming by today, too, man. Yeah, absolutely, man. Yeah. Like, feel like lifelong friends in the in the internet game, you nah, know? For back real. from us being like Boulevard Street and Dirty, you know? It's like, yes, sir, man. It's like, man, back, bro, from, you know, people don't even know how many showcases we've thrown Ooh. together was... South by Southwest and mm -hmm. A3C. Yep. Like, we put together a show. Uh, a lot of people remember the one with Devin the Dude. We brought Devin oh, yeah. the Dude to Atlanta, That's you know? Right. I was like, me and Spitty putting our money together like, oh, we got to, you know, like no way to even make the money back because you yeah. couldn't even charge at the A3C event, you know, but we're like, God, I got to bring Devin. Yep. That's yeah. classic, bro. I always so, yeah, tell people, time. man, like, Burn, you was one of the first ones to ever comment on like one of our posts of someone that was in the industry that I actually recognized. I was like, DJ Burn one? Oh, man, we lit, man. <laughs> I swear, you was like the first person that I actually knew, like in the industry that actually like was commenting and supporting us, man, so. That's it's dope, always man. been love since then, but absolutely. Likewise, I felt like we were kindred spirits and bringing like real music to the internet. Yeah, you know. Yeah, definitely, man. So, but uh, before then, let's take it back, man. So let's go back. Um, you actually got your start just by working in a record store, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I started off doing mixes at the house, just doing mixing like instrumentals, acapellas. People call them blends now. Yeah. Mashups. So I was just pretty much doing that, learning how to match instrumentals with acapellas and it's funny how much I still do that to this day so many times I have to like do that I'm like I'm doing what I was doing I was like 14 years old just like way better now um but so I started and I was originally um just working at that CD I was really selling CDs at the at my school and so that's really where I started selling CDs at school I was selling mixtapes to like just the top eight songs on the radio like Greg Street's top eight at eight I would just burn them on a CD because nobody really knew about CD burners or where to get songs online and I'd burn them and uh, sell them, and I got that job at the mom and pop store, okay. uh, Super Sound. Yeah. And so from there, I had a guy, 29, from IAP TV, which was another internet site back in the day. Mm -hmm. And he was like, why don't you do a real tape? I was like, what is a real tape? The only real tapes I knew was like DJ Jelly and Oomp Camp and okay. super scratchy and super, you know, I was like, oh, I don't know, you know? And uh, he was like, nah, like DJ Drama and them, you know, like exclusives and you find different artists that you want to promote and different things. And really it's about like taste and networking and all this stuff. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'll try it. I think I started to hear drama and, and what they were doing at the time. And so I was like, well, let me just try it. And so I started calling around and it just so happened uh, Ecstasy, the girl okay, group that yeah. was signed to Grand Hustle at the time. They were like a year older than me. And so either they were seniors and I started talking about it or they had just graduated. And I just happened to ask them, would T.I. host one of my tapes? After I did like one and a half tapes. I literally had one mixtape called Grill in the Trunk 2.7 or 2. something. 7. It was like a random like number. I was like, I was just goofy with it, you know, like 2.7. I'll just make them wonder where number one is, you know? And, uh, and so I put that out and then that did kind of cool. And it made, it gave me just a little bit enough of legitimacy for them to be like, when I asked them, would y'all and T.I. host a tape? Yeah. This was right before Trunk Music, a couple months before, not Trunk Music, Trap Music. Okay. Before Trap Music came out. And they were like, uh, she was like, yeah, we'll, we'll go ahead and hmm. call them. I was like, really? And so he calls my phone while I'm a senior in high school, just leaves a voice message on my little Nokia. Remember the little blue phone? Like the little blue joint that wasn't flip or nothing. It was yeah. just straight and long and, and left me some drops. Oh, and they wow. all left me drops on my phone. Shoot. And so I had my first, you know, real mixtape hosted by TI and PSE, Gorilla in the Trunk. And um, that really gave me legitimacy. That like helped put me in the game. And then TI, uh, I don't know if he like gave me uh, you know, free reign in the studio, but I just started popping in the studio. Like nobody really invited me up there, but I kind of just started going up to Grand <laughs> Hustle and just sitting around. And so I'd sit around like a big country, okay, yeah. big country king, mm -hmm. and I would watch him work. And I just remember looking at the Pro Tools screen and seeing all the different colors. Mm -hmm. And I was working with full instrumentals and full acapellas, like essentially like, you know, the full thing. And I'm looking at stems now and I'm not knowing what stems are. He's like, oh, that red one's a kick, man. The blue one's a snare. The right, well, you know, he's like telling me what these sounds are. I'm like, I still don't know what this is. I'm like, I love it, you know? I love it. And so I just was able to just hang around and be around. And that's how I met Young Dro. Okay. That yeah. was how I ended up doing uh, his first mixtape, was just because he was walking, he, was, he kept coming to the studio and he was the funniest person. 
I was like, this guy's like a larger than life character. He's so funny and he was just rapping. I was like, this dude is raw. Like if people hear him, you know, I was around everybody, like Mac Boney could really rap all these people. I'm like, Dro, something about him. He just seemed like a cartoon character. It's like, he's like larger than life. <laughs> this was before shoulder lean, huh? This is before so shoulder lean. Yeah. I've always just kind of gone off. Like if I think something is funny or entertaining, maybe somebody else might think it is too. Yeah. And so I was like, well, let me just spend some time. And so I spent like a month up at Grand Hustle. Mm -hmm. And I don't even think at the time, me and him, I didn't have a cell phone number. <laughs> and this is, I'm still in high school. And so every day after I get off high school, I would just go up to Grand Hustle and just sit there for like a month and just wait for him to show up hopefully <laughs> and he'll show up like a milk crate carton full of raps oh, wow. and i would just pull up random instrumentals because i wasn't making beats yet so i'd pull up like an eight ball mjg instrumental like lincoln park and jay jay z instrumental i just pull up like random stuff i would just be like what would he sound like on this and he would literally like just i'd pull up a beat he'd be like pull something up and the engineer would pull it up and he would just start flipping through like going through the crate and just flipping through rhymes i was like this man's got so many raps and he'd be like <laughs> All right, cool, I'm good. And he would just go in there and just rap 46 bars or however, however long, and I would just take that and just put him to the side, and then I just took some of his older songs and put it together, because we didn't have that much new materials, like maybe nine, nine joints or something. Yeah. And so put that together, and then Shoulder Lean, that was like about to be his next single. I didn't know what that was about to be, and so we put that on there. And so the week his tape came out, Shoulder Lean got added to radio. Oh, wow. <laughs> the week the album, you know, the week our mixtape came out, Shoulder Lean, Perfect uh, got added to Hot 107, and I was like, this is crazy. You know, I was like, this guy was just hanging out in the studio. Nobody was even really, you know, stunning him, and now he's, he's got a song added, and so I saw him the week after, and he was like, yo, I just want to tell you thank you. He was like, I have a fan base now. He was like, people tell me that I have fans. He was like, they're telling me they're fans. He was like, people used to tell me they like my song or they like a rap. He was like, but them hearing that whole body of work, they're saying they're my fans now. They're like, yo, I'm your fan. He was like, I want to say thank you, you know? So he was like one of the first people to just like ever say thank you for, yeah. you know, helping him out, you know? And it was like something that I saw because I knew if people heard a body of work, they'd be like, this dude's dope. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's funny for him to come back to me and tell me that. I was like, that's, that's, that's great. That's you know, super. that just made me feel good, you know? Yeah. It really did. I was like, and then seeing more people get onto it and it was just really dope seeing this stuff grow. Were you guys uploading it to the internet at this time? Or oh was yeah, this? bro. Okay. That was my whole thing was people were messing with me because I'd kind of figured out the early internet. Hmm. Because I went from the earliest version, like people don't even know, like before Kazaa and Napster and all that, there was AOL chat rooms oh, yeah. that you could download music That's from. That's how I discovered 3-6 you know? Mafia, Crooked Letters. Bro, you just type in send, whatever the command line was for <laughs> yeah. the album, all one, you know, high, you know, the little underscores and stuff, and then it would send you an album overnight. And yep. you have 56K, so you'd let it download oh, over, man, it overnight. Oh, man, hours. Oh, the whole, oh, I'll just let it download overnight and burn me a CD in the morning, <laughs> you know? That was, like, my whole thing. But I'd figured out kind of the internet early. And so yeah. from there to, you know, MRRC and Kazaa and Napster and all that stuff and to finally blogs, mm -hmm. I was like, oh, this is great. People are talking about, you know? So that was, like, my, the blogs was my thing. And so I started just developing uh, networks and relationships, like, just loving sites like Dirty Glove and yeah. all these different things. And um, people... Uh, as I was releasing tapes, they were like, oh, he's getting into more people than just people in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that was like a big thing of how Chicken Talk spread so much. Okay. Like it was going crazy in the Midwest and stuff like that, but that was really off of bootlegging. Because really? people were downloading it online. Because yeah, I, I was, <laughs> it was popping so online so much, they were like just getting it everywhere, you know? <laughs> so how were you able to talk Gucci into, because that's his first tape. I'm sure he was like, free music, fuck this shit. <laughs> Bro, he didn't get it at all. He didn't get it. So how I met Gucci was I'd call, this was around the time when 29 had told me, he was like, just call around and just try to find some songs. So I was literally, literally just listening to the radio and then trying to find people that I heard. Hmm. What else did I, there was nothing, the blogs weren't even really popping Yeah, there was the no Twitter at this point. No, this is like 2004, 2005, yeah. none of that. So I would call, well, this is what I did. So I heard the Black Tea remix. Okay. So it was like the response to White Tea. Yeah. And it was from a record label called Never Again. And so I looked them up in the phone book. <laughs> Straight up, bro. Looked them up in the phone book because they had a real studio. I didn't know. I didn't know anything. I just looked it up. It said Never Again Records. I called it. Gucci Man picks up. <laughs> he actually picked up. Gucci Man's the one that picks up. You know, like so ambitious. I love it. So he picks up the phone. He's like, yeah, come up here. And so I just come up there immediately. And immediately he takes me to Zaytoven's house. Oh, wow. He like takes me straight from Never Again Records over, to, over there, you know. And I was like, all right, he plays me so icy. This is the first, like, this is my first meeting with him, just all random chance, like straight chance from calling this number in the phone book. And so he plays me so icy, and I was like, that's Lil Will? And he was like, yeah. I was like, you put auto-tune on Lil Will? 
<laughs> he was like, yeah. I was like, really? You know, I was like, I love looking for Nikki and like that real soulful little will. So to hear it sound kind of robotic and autotune wasn't the wave at all. T-Pain was the only person I was really using mm -hmm. it at the time before, you know, after share. And so I was like, oh, uh. you know, I wasn't like you hear it. And I feel, now I realize if a song is kind of jarring to you, maybe it's something new. Maybe because if you don't hate it or love it, it's never going to really jump. Yeah. You know, you got to have like a that type of thing to it. And so um, I heard it and I was like, I don't really know. But I just know he played me other songs and I was like, oh, this is great. And the same thing. He was so funny. I was like, he's rapping about the most street shit, but it's funny. I'm like, he's so funny. You know, I'm like, why am I laughing about him robbing people? And, you know, the stuff he's saying, I'm like, why is it? Why is this funny to me? I'm like, I got I got to do something with him. And so I was like, yo, we should do a mixtape. And he's like, what's that? <laughs> I was like, uh, you know, you get, you just put your songs out and then you don't have to worry about a label. And he was like, well, I kind of just signed and I don't know what you're talking about, so I don't want to do that. And I was like, I appreciate you telling me that because a lot of people give you the runaround around the industry. They'll yeah. give you the number and then make you just chase them instead of just saying, I'm not interested. So you save everybody's time, you know? You, re you really do. It's very easy to just say, I'm not interested or I don't have time. And most people don't do it, but he did it and I was like, Thanks. I told him thanks. I was like, I appreciate it. You know, he was like, what? I was like, you didn't give me the runaround. I was like, this is. And so we literally didn't talk for a year. And so So Icy came out, blew up, and then it kind of cooled off. And I think he went to jail for that promoter with the pool stick incident. Okay. And then came out and then he dropped my chain and it didn't do so good. And Atlanta has a history of one hit wonders for all the all the great things we've done. We just have a bunch of one hit wonders as well. Um, not only one hit wonders, but we, you know, there's a lot of people who just have one song and it's like a classic and then you don't really hear, you know, nothing else. And so people kind of thought maybe Gucci just kind of dropped that classic and then that was just kind of his thing. And he called me. He was like, what was that thing you were talking about? <laughs> I was like, a mixtape? He was like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> you know, he was beefing with the label. I didn't even know none of this, you know, I didn't know any of it until later, but he was beefing with the label and all this stuff. And so I pitched him on well, even at the time, he didn't really know. Later on, I pitched him on. I was like, you're going to be able to get your music out to people, connect with people. You can go and do shows on your own. And you don't have to worry about a label. Mm -hmm. And so to him, he was like, this is my chance at freedom and yeah. not getting stuck in this situation. And so we spent like a month working on it. Oh, like almost every day, pretty wild times. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> pretty wild times, but we almost spent every other day working on it. And so the project ended up being a mix of songs he already had recorded and some new stuff. Like he did the burn one freestyle. He was so happy to do that. He called me over. He's like, oh my God, so, you know, came over and laid it. I was like, this is great. He just kept saying burn one. Yeah. I was like, he was so happy saying it. He just used to love saying my name. I was like, this is great. You know, <laughs> it's wonderful. And, um, and so, yeah, that was just a, a really good time. And then to see it come out, cause I really executive produced the project. Like from the beginning, like spearheaded, he had probably three quarters of the songs and then we put the other ones, but I was the one that said, instead of putting 24 on one CD, I was like, bro, this isn't no limit. I was yeah. like, give me, I was like, no limit, you know, it was like, let's just do 12 and 12, one CD and then, you know, two CDs. And then uh, I took the cover, I took the picture for the cover. Mm -hmm. I got the artwork done. I pretty much just executive produced it and then handled all the distribution, uh, at least physically. Yeah. Uh, like printed them up and I remember like the first time we went to Discount Mall like we walked in there I had him in the truck like he came we had like a forerunner or something at the time and I pulled up in it and uh, he stayed in the truck and I went in and I remember having them and because they were double I was wholesaling them for four dollars instead of two dollars and the guy was like four dollars he's like Gucci man he's like man he's ice cold he's like man don't nobody want this and like kind of shoved it back to me and I was like whatever you know, whatever. I grabbed it and just walked right back out. And as soon as I walk out, Gucci has people surrounding the car. <laughs> he's playing it and people yeah. are just surrounding the car. And he's selling them right out of the car. The dude comes running out the store. Man, let me get 40. <laughs> you know, it's like, that's why I tell people, you should never go off of other people's opinions. You know, you will let somebody kill your dream faster than anything else just listening to somebody's random opinion, you know? If I didn't know what I had, I didn't know really what I had, but I knew it was better than, you know, than nothing. I'm like, man, I know I got some heat right here. It's like, oh, it's cold. I'm like, all right. You didn't even want to hear it. You know, you didn't even want to hear it. You're just going to say it was over. I'm like, all right. Just so walk right back outside. People swarm in the car. I was like, this is dope. Yeah. You know? I know you wanted to turn it into an NFT also. What yeah, it's actually, 
Bro, it's still forthcoming, bro. Uh, apparently, his lawyers don't want me to release it, hmm. which is crazy, bro, because I really haven't made any money off of it since it came out, since yeah. I did that initial. And then, like I said, bootlegging picked up, so it wasn't like I made like a killing off the distribution. Like I put it online and yeah. just kind of you know ran with it from bootlegging, but uh it's all good bro they don't want me to drop it i still have like the three cds i have like the two cds he gave me with the raw songs <laughs> the two cds with my master disc and then the actual final copy okay so i may still just drop it and say F it, you know but i don't know it's kind of weird bro you know like i see everybody's kind of touchy-feely about getting in nfts i saw jay-z suing dame dash and all this it's like i don't think people understand what it is and they're just like no yeah they're like if you're making money off of it then yeah, but it's like, honestly, really, if I wanted to sell it, I probably will sell it, you know? <laughs> honestly, facts, bro. I, I mean, I probably still will sell it. I just hadn't figured out exactly what I want to do with it because you got to think, it's memorabilia, bro. Mm -hmm. These, I'm not selling the rights to the music. I'm just selling the physical copies of what I have Yeah. that nobody else has. You know, come on, bro. Somebody probably paid a million dollars for that shit, you know? Because <laughs> it's, it's for real. It's like nobody has heard those songs untagged or not in the sequence that we have. Like, bro. So I'll probably still drop it. Yeah. against the lawyer's wishes you know <laughs> hey i don't sometimes really care. you gotta take it into your own hands sometimes bro. because man bro it's like we put this effort in bro and for some reason i don't know why people that haven't like something in the industry people that don't have something to do with the main part of what happened always want to crab on it they always want to crab on it like if you didn't have an actual part in the beginning for some reason the people that because the people that told me no we're not around hmm. who are these people bro you know the people that are emailing me i'm like I don't even know y'all. Can I get Gucci on the line, bro? Yeah. You know, and it's like, no, but all, all the people around, you know, the new handlers are saying no. So it's crazy, you know, they were not shooting with us in the gym, bro. <laughs> they were not, you know, and the fact that I, I taught him mixtapes, you know, if you read his autobiography, yeah. it says in there the whole story of how I taught him mixtapes, mm -hmm. you know. No, he definitely gave you props for it. Guess I'll take that as payment, bro. Yeah. You know, like, <laughs> thanks, you know, we'll, we'll take the shout out as payment, you know, we'll cash that, you know. Yeah. So all good, bro. What was your inspiration going into uh, creating Boulevard Street? Boulevard Street, bro, was really like a creative outlet for me at a time of where I just wanted to make beats. I kind of got, I was doing mixtapes for a while and a lot of the tapes I was doing, I was working with dope rappers like Freddie Gibbs, and Phil, mm -hmm. and all these people. But I just wasn't loving a lot of the beats, not just theirs, but just the other people were rapping on too. And I was like, instead of just complaining, let me create the alternative. And I always wanted to make the antidote. You know, I'm like, if this is what's going on, I'm going to make the antidote to that. And so I just want to make beats. And so I was like, I'm going to make five beats a day for a year. And that's what I did. But about a month in, I was like, I need a hobby. Like, <laughs> I need a hobby. Like, I got to do something else because I stopped doing everything else except hosting mixtapes. And that didn't really take that much time. So I was like, I need something to fill my time. And so I was like, why don't I find, like, I'm always coming up on this dope music anyways. Why don't I just share it? I already love all these blogs. Yeah. Why don't I just put it up on my own? And so it's funny enough, just doing that, and we used to post up so much music and find all these new artists and just help to spread the word on these dope artists. But it was funny because just doing that is how Yams found me, oh, which really? is how I ended up getting the ASAP Rocky placement. That's it. Because they found Boulevard Street, Yams found Boulevard Street. You know, he was like the tastemaker of the group. Mm -hmm. So he was like, oh, we need to get in this hip, you know, Southern blog. And so they had sent me something before. It was even ASAP Rocky. ASAP wasn't even a thing. It was just Rocky. He had yeah. a song called Been Around the World. Yep, I, I think, you know? That. And uh, so I posted that up, and I remember writing, like, New York dude with the South flow. <laughs> Pretty cool. <laughs> like, I think that was literally my, my, uh, my summarization. And, uh, and, and uh, you know, it's funny because maybe a couple, couple months after that, I don't know how long, sometime after Peso drops, mm -hmm. it starts going crazy. And so I flew to New York. I forget who I was working with, but I flew up there to New York on a media run and I was trying to find him. I'm like, where's Rocky? I'm talking to everybody. I'm like, plug me with Rocky. And it's like, couldn't do it. Couldn't find, couldn't find a connection. And literally two days after I get back, I get a call. Hey, you've got two placements on ASAP Rocky's first project. <laughs> I'm like, really? I was just in New York trying to find him and I couldn't find him. They're like, yeah, you got two on there. I was like, I didn't even send him any beats. <laughs> I didn't send him any beats. I was like, how did he get them? And they were like, they did, the A and R just played them for me on the phone, and I was like, "Sound Click." Sound Click was like an early license lounge. Yeah, you had uh, just Beat uploaded Stars them website. up there. Yeah, and so I, at the end of the year that I was making beats, I literally just thought they were just practice beats. I didn't, you know, they don't really have value at that time. They're so fresh, and so I was like, oh, "I'm not really gonna do anything with these." And so I just put a bunch of them on Sound Click to lease, and so I think they just found them on there.
That's it. Yams found them on there, and then Rocky laid them down, and so that ended up becoming rolling up in Houston Old Head. Yep. And yeah. now it's on streaming sites. Yeah, now it's on streaming <laughs> sites. And 10 years later, your boy's finally getting paid. Finally. Because I've been on record about not getting paid about this. You know what I'm saying? So I would like to update it and be like, finally, it is getting paid. Not because they want to, but because they want to do they the 10-year anniversary. Yeah. It's like they want it on streaming finally, you know? And so I'm just glad it's out and it's finally going to be like, you know, as permanent as streaming is, you know, up there for a while. So yeah, it's good to finally get it up there and not just on random mixtape websites with hella tags and stuff yep. you know so how did you discover yellow wolf and trunk music how did that come about yellow wolf was cool so i met him through pill okay literally if you looked at look at the uh, trap gone hand video shoot i don't know if he was in there but he was just like yellow wolf was just like sitting on the floor in the corner like like literally like just in the floor in the corner just so chill and somebody's like this is yellow wolf i was like hey what's up you know i was just sitting there i was like what's up man you know and so uh, that was cool. In a couple, maybe like a month or two later, Jay Dirt like gave us an official introduction. Okay. And he was like, "Y'all should do a project together." I don't know why I think y'all should do a project together, but y'all should do something. So appreciate my boy Jay Dirt for that. It's one of one of the big homies. Shout out to Ballers Eve, yes, another sir. big internet That's player. Right They're a huge radio station up there uh, in New York for a while. That a big show. Um, but so he plugged me up with them. He was like, "Y'all should do something." And I gave him some beats and he did this record called Country Girl. It was super tight, but we didn't end up using it. And so literally he did that, he played it for me. I was like, this is cool. And then like, I think the next day him and Willpower went out to uh, uh, Alabama and they knocked it out. Oh wow. Yeah, and they did the whole project and came back. And I remember sitting with Malay, who Malay has done so much, so many records now, like, cause Malay did, um, I wish he would, I think off that project. Mm -hmm. But man, he did like, uh, now he's done like, Green Light for John Legend. Bro, he's done like so many huge records, bro. Like, ridiculous. But I remember watching him and sitting here watching him mix that. Like, I got to sit in KP's basement. Oh, wow. Which is pretty crazy. You yeah. know, Kwan Prout, they're like one of the greatest A&Rs and, you know, DJs in hip hop. Um, I got to sit in his basement and watch Malay mix that and just listen to, you know, kind of like his mindset. I remember just the main thing that sticks with me from him mixing it was you only want a noticeable effect on one thing. And I was like, okay. And I didn't realize until I really started playing with effects that if there's reverb or delay on everything, there's reverb or delay on nothing. You know, so it's like really like making it for an effect and to make you hear it, don't do it all the time basically. Or, and you know, just having on one thing. So that was really dope. I've really been blessed to be able to sit up under people like that, like him and um, Mr. DJ, oh, DJ yeah. Toomp. DJ Toomp, I spent a lot of time just sitting with him and watching him work. And now we make beats together and stuff. So that's really dope. No, that's super dope, man. Then. Yeah, because like back in the day around when I was uh, doing mixtapes and kind of just wanting to get my foot in the door, as soon as I got around Grand Hustle, I was like, man, these producers, whatever these beat makers are, this is what I want to be around. You know, the people making the beats. I like the rappers. I'm like, but the beats, I need to, I need to know about this. And so I was like, what can I do to help get the signal up and like help get, get me around these producers? And I was like, well, I could film a hip hop DVD. And so I filmed a hip hop DVD called The Fix. I didn't know how to film. I didn't know how to edit. I didn't know how to shoot, bro. I didn't know how to do any of it. I didn't have access to a computer that could handle anything. And this was before you could learn on YouTube how to do stuff. Like, bro, it was nothing. And so I had a friend who had a camera and he would pop up and shoot with me. And then I had a friend who went to AIU, the Art Institute, and they had a computer lab. And I would use his little card to swipe to go in there. And I would just sit there and just trial and error and just fumbled my way through the whole process and I came out with it bro you know like came out with it. I'd interviewed DJ Toon for Mr. DJ I went on the road with Fabo and D4L oh wow right when Laffy Taffy came out Whew. bro that was I know a good that time was wild. yeah bro so funny bro and Fabo just on one which is funny I got a single coming out with Fabo in a month with, really um yeah with John William it's oh, his nice. next single flautist yeah I think y'all just did an interview mm -hmm. with John yep, William yep. we did um so we got that coming out but yeah so I did that with them and then that allowed me to start coming back around them. Cause I was like, what can I do to be around them? I was like, well, nobody ever promotes the producers. So I'm like, if I do something to where they can talk about what they're doing, I'll just be around, I'll just be able to be around. And so what I did was after I did the interview with DJ Toomp, I called the next time I was in, like in the West side, I think he was on the West end. And I was like, yo, I'm around. He was like, that's what's up. I, like, I got some green, can I come through? He was like, yeah, yeah, come on youngin. You know, it's like, That'll get you in the door, you know? The fact that I was cool, I came out with something to help get a signal up, you know? Came with a little gift, you know? Yeah. Um, but it was, it was really cool. And so, like, people like him just used to let me sit in the studio and just watch them. 
and we would just talk about music. And I've always just been a fan, so like little things I would pick up on the music and just nerd out and talk about stuff. Yeah. So I feel like a lot of the stuff when I'm producing and mixing, subconsciously they're like in the back of my head kind of talking to me, you know, like when I'm chopping a sample I hear uh, DJ Toon, like, better lock that sample in, youngin'. <laughs> you know, I hear like these voices of, you know, these greats, so it's really dope. Yeah, just being a sponge, just soaking bro. up all that game, bro. Oh, it's amazing. It's, I mean, it's like priceless, right it's yeah, like priceless exactly. game. Who gets to sit in the studio with, you know, your favorite producers and just get to pick their brain? Bro, I asked a thousand questions and I'm still the same way to this day. I just had a 45 minute conversation with KLC. Really? KLC from Beats by the Pound. Yeah. And I, t- bro, I picked his brain about like <laughs> everything, bro, where the horn from this song came from and where the snare from T.I.'s What It Do came from and where, you know, and he's like, oh, that was from this record and this was from that and this is how I did that. And just giving me so much game. I'm like, bro, this is, it's really crazy. It almost makes me want to start like a producer podcast, just like something online, maybe just my conversations with these producers yeah. or something. Because Ricky always tells me, he's like, why aren't we filming this? <laughs> Not for real. You know, I'm like, I'm just talking endlessly and they're just like, I'm just naturally, I'm curious. So I'm getting all this stuff out of them. And they're always like, nobody really asked me these questions. I'm like, nobody, you know, nobody's asking you where this snare came from or where this, but so many people want to know, but who has access to them, mm-hmm. you know? So I kind of feel like just super blessed to be around these people. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Ricky, man, talk about how the Five Points uh, music group came about. Man. Oh yeah, the Five Points Bakery, bro. So. Five Points came about uh, as I was trying to, <laughs> so before Five Points, there was McVegas. Mm-hmm. So McVegas was my original kind of idea of like how I wanted to create a production team. I was like, I just wanted to call it like it was a person, you know, and it'd be multiple people. I always thought that idea was dope. And, uh, you know, live instrumentation and all this stuff. And so as I was doing beats that first year, kind of like halfway through, I was like, I'm going to do McVegas. Like, I'm going to find some people. And then nobody ended up joining. And so <laughs> it ended up just being like a pseudonym for me. And I was like, I'm not Nick Vegas. You know, it was like, it was supposed to be us. Like whoever these ma- imaginary people were, you know, and it just never materialized. So I was like, going back to burn one. That's why I ran inside his gangster, my yeah. first project, he gets killed off. You know, he was like, RIP <laughs> Nick Vegas, welcome back burn one. You know, it's like Star Lito comm- commemorated that one for us, you know. <laughs> um, and so from that, I never, I never gave up hope. You know, I was still like, you know, maybe it just won't be that incarnation. And so I ended up looking around just just kind of through the grapevine, ended up finding um, Ricky. Just it was kind of like a, a local legend of people that had always you know, seen him perform and played on records and stuff. And I'd always heard his name. And then Walt Live, I was I was managing him when he had produced like Hold Up hold up for player circle it was like okay, the first yeah. tid boy song that was mm-hmm. two chains he said two cha- this was the first song he said two chains on um he produced god in the building for killer mike back then so i was managing him when he was doing that stuff tracy t swagger right check okay. he did all those records right on, around that time and so um we ended up linking back up and got with a bass player and we just jammed out and that ended up becoming like the ashtray our first project yeah so we came out with that and then we were like all right let's, let's keep it going and so we just locked in and we'd lock in for like maybe 12 to 15 hour days, like five, six days a week. Shoo. Just living this shit. <laughs> Bro, just going in. So we'd just come down to Pro's house and just bang out all day, every day, like just workshop and woodshed and just like keep creating, keep creating, keep creating. And so that was really how we found a lot of our sound and stuff just through experimentation. And it's interesting to hear a lot of stuff picking up today is stuff that we were like, mm-hmm. you know, yeah, you guys were so, all live, everything bro, before. You know, so it was nice to hear it coming in now, but it's like, we're already ahead of that. You know, it's like n- people are just now using live instruments in this stuff again, mm-hmm. but we're already flipping our live samples into, you know what I'm saying? It's like, we're already like moving, you know? So it's cool, bro. I just want to inspire people. And now with the masterclass, help them learn, yeah. you know, kind of share the secrets of what we have so far and learn, learn from some other people. Definitely, man. We can get to that in a second. All right, so let's talk about some of these South by shows, man. So um, the one that really sticks out to me, I think it was 2012. That's the one that had like Dolph, Gotti, um, Starlito. I don't think Starlito actually showed up though. But I had like Don Tripp, Currency, so many people. But what really sticks out to me was when Dolph showed up, and I think you had the DJ for him, and he literally just handed you a CD that was his mixtape <laughs> with the bigger ranking drops. Do you remember that? Because I always tell people this story. Bro, man. I'll be so, honest, I really don't. 
That's what's so crazy, bro. I've done bro, it was so like a much, bro. Hour show that we did that. Day. That's what I was about to say. I remember those shows were marathons, bro. Yeah. You know, marathons. And then my brain would already be warped because I would be driving all of us in a 15 passenger <laughs> van from Atlanta to Austin, like nonstop, not stopping anywhere for the night. And for whatever reason, I just love driving, bro. And so I'll drive the whole 15 hours by oh, myself, hell, even man. though it's like 13 people in there. And we were just like, everybody just freestyling and smoking the whole time, you know, just going down there on a 15 hour trip to Austin. So every time I get to Austin, my brain would just be kind of like mush. <laughs> and then we'll get into it. And it was like nonstop. But bro, no, all that was like a great time. Yeah. What venue was that at again? That was the one that we were on the rooftop. Oh, I do remember, bro. Yeah. I, you know what's so funny? What I remember from that one was, I was like, that was the only time I've been scared of a rapper, bro. <laughs> Which one? Who was? Not, not like scared, like I was in trouble or something, you know? But just like, you know, literally I never really cared, you know, like all the tough guys, stuff with rappers, I never really cared. But bro, I remember I was trying to get back on stage just to DJ and Yo Gotti was performing, bro. He had like a hundred dudes in black shirts, <laughs> dog, that were like seven foot tall. And I remember like walking up and I was like, I got a DJ, he was like, he wouldn't even look at me, bro. I was like, <laughs> I was like, I got a DJ. He's like, and I like try to like weasel through, bro. He kind of like pushed me. I was like, bro, I have to get up there. And he looked at me like, if you do it again. And I was like, I remember looking at one of y'all. I was like, Spitty or somebody. I think it was Mo or somebody. I was like, yeah. bro, help me. Bro. Or it was the other DJ. That's what it was. It was another DJ. And he was like, no, 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 no. He's with us. He was like, he got me up there. I was like, bro, what is going on? I mean, it was just like. <laughs> I was like, I've never cared before. I was like, God, he got this thing together. That bro. show was crazy because that was, like, I think, uh, Ace at Rocky's um, first South by. Oh, so yeah. So Yam showed up. I think uh, Chase, Chase of Cash was his DJ. And he dropped oh, that. That was the first time I met Mac Miller, too. Just really? randomly walking through there. Yeah. yeah. And they dropped the, the Chief Keef record. And the whole place went crazy. That's like yeah. when 300, or I think oh, I just I do dropped. remember all that. Yeah. It was wild. Oh, that was when the Cash and Out record just came out, too. Yep. I remember all this. Oh, yeah. yeah. That rooftop show that was That show was crazy. That's the one was. where Zip fell asleep on stage. And I'm like, how do you fall asleep during a concert on the stage? Right. But that's it. <laughs> bro. Legendary, bro. Nah, 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 that was a good time, man. Dolph was such a good dude, bro. Yeah. Really was, man. Like, even just pulled up to the house to drop a verse or something. Oh, like, yeah. Just whatever you need, bro. Yeah. You know, it's just such an awesome person, man. Yeah. Long live Dolph, man. Absolutely, bro. Um, talk about uh, how you discovered Pierre Bourne, too. Bro, Pierre was, bro, that was fun and just completely random. Completely <laughs> random. Because I'm always doing these things of going to events and judging beat battles or just doing anything I can help, you know, like help give back or listen to other people or just whatever. Always just stay in touch with the community. And so I was doing a beat critique for I Standard Music. Hmm. And they had a, uh, they had the, they had it at SAE. And so okay. he was going to school at SAE for like engineering. And so they had the students come in and just would play a beat. I'll give a critique and then the next one in. So a couple of people came in to play beats and I would just give them my little critique and then he came in and played something. I think it was a sampling Street Fighter really? or something. And I was like, I like this. You know, I was like, I like this. And I remember the first thing I told him right then was, but don't sample again. That's what you told him? <laughs> yeah, I was like, advice. I love this. I was like, but don't sample again. And he was like, what? I was like, man, I get paid from the ASAP Rocky thing. You know what I'm saying? I was oh, like, yeah, they'll hold sure. it over your head if, if it ain't, you know, I was like, especially something like Street Fighter, bro. Yep. You know, I was like, they're, they're, you know, maybe we'll get it clear, but maybe it'll hold up your money. I was like, <laughs> you got to be able to make music that sounds like a sample. And I was on the journey at the time of figuring that out myself, you know, mm -hmm. but I'm just always like trying to share and, you know, do it as I'm going along. And, uh, and so I was like, you know what, would you want to come back to the house and jam? I was like, I never really invited anybody that I've just been at a beat battle with or whatever to just come to the house and jam, but would you want to come and just, uh, just work a little bit and see what we can come up with? And he was like, yeah. And so he came over and we did a couple of beats together. I'll be honest, I don't know what it was that just made me think something could happen. But I just remember telling him, I was like, I've never signed a producer before. I was like, but would you want to sign? He was like, yeah. And I gave him the contract he signed, you know, a couple days, gave it back or whatever. I was like, yeah. all right. And so I would just let him uh, sit in the back of the room and just watch us work. And so he saw I was working with the musicians, like effects I was using and all this stuff. And he just got to like just soak in the game, kind of like I was with Toomp and just kind of like passing it along. And so I'll go and like pick him up in Marietta, his apartment, oh, you know, really? like every wow. day, like go pick him up in Marietta, go to Corey Moe's on the east side. Oh, wow. You know, this is a Corey <laughs> Moe's. So we brought him over there. And that was actually how he got with Nudie. Yeah. His Walt Live was mm -hmm. over there working, uh, not like studio managing, but kind of a little bit at the time. And Nudie needed an engineer. And Walt was like, who should I put in there? I was like, 
Pierre's not really ready. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I was like, but we'll just throw him in the fire. You know, it's like the best way to learn. No, right? I was like, there's literally no other way than to learn, you know? And so uh, we put him in there and then, you know, that kicked off their whole relationship. And so he just watched us for like probably like four to six months. And then he got a job engineering, I think Epic or something. And mm -hmm. like a month or two later, Magnolia uh, oh, came shit. out. I was like, this is crazy, yeah. you know? No, that's super dope right there. Yeah, man, so I was really dope. It's really cool when just something interests you, you put some time into it, and then you see other people care about it too. Yeah. You're like, oh, y'all feel it, like I feel it. Like, yeah, I'm not tripping, you know? It's like Gucci becoming the most influential rapper of the past 10 years. You know, probably Pierre being the most influential producer the past five years. Yep. It's not nothing, bro. You know what I'm saying? And it's cool to just not even on like ego, but just be like, I saw it. You know, I saw it and then now they're really getting it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, bro, it's a beautiful thing. You know, and to know that I just had a hand in it. You know, I didn't make them or anything like that, but just had a hand in helping and helping guide them a little bit. That's like, it's priceless, bro. You know, oh, it feels good to be able to help bring that to the culture. And you know, that to me is dope music. Yeah. You know, it's like for all the stuff I watch, I was watching Yo! MTV the other day. I was like, music needs us, bro. Shoot. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm literally shifting my whole attention from essentially what I've been doing, which is freelancing and working for other people to this year, just working for myself and releasing my own music and focusing on myself, bro. You know, it's like, I didn't get this dope to be working for other people, bro. You know, and asking other people for things and being like, you need to pay me right now. I'm just getting myself, bro. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, so that's really just the wave I'm on now. I got you. All right, so Burn, go ahead and introduce who's joining you on the porch, man, and what you guys got going on right now, man. Yo, what's up? I got my man, the letter L Beats right now, in the building. So, professor from? University, University. of Illinois. Yeah, absolutely. And so, uh, he actually is the instructor for the course that has just recently come out based on my production masterclass options. So, I have a forthcoming production masterclass called Options. And so, he's actually the teacher at the class. Okay. Yeah, at the college. And so, it's in its sixth week now? Uh, yes, it's week six, going to week seven. Yeah, oh, wow. yeah. yeah. and so it's asynchronous, so it's not like a uh, class that everybody has to attend and people can log in online. Yeah, yeah. So what is this class about? <laughs> so the class is about, so it's called Music Monetization 499. Okay. It incorporates all of my master class from the beginning because I don't feel like there's been like a way for people to learn because I don't feel like there's been a way for people to learn properly for the modern day producer and musician. Like I feel like all a lot of the, the courses at colleges and just places that you can learn now aren't, um, aren't for the modern day producer, you know, for networking. People don't understand the soft skills of just getting along with people. It's just as important as knowing the musical notes, it's just as important as being able to get along with people and just talk to people and communicate and help get what you want out of people in a, in a good way, you know what I'm saying? And like. Uh, I feel like what we're doing is kind of teaching a well-rounded approach of like definitely going deep on production, bro. Like all the stuff I was talking about, the little lessons I've learned from DJ Toomp and all these people, I'm putting all those tips and tricks in there and kind of showing from the beginning uh, drum programming, how to sample, why to sample, what, you know, because I, I do a lot of consultations and I did uh, one with this guy and he'd been producing for like nine or 10 years and never sampled. I'm like, that's why your music kind of sounds boring. You know, it's like, cause you don't know the concepts of sampling. So you don't even know how to flip your original stuff into making it sound fresh, you know? Like this is literally why I got into production because at the time when I started making beats, there was a transition period between sampling and people using live keyboards. But people, when they started using live keyboards and not sampling because of all those, they would just kind of do like plinky plunky. You know, it wasn't really musical. It didn't sound like a sample. And so my whole thing was trying to figure out how to make music sound like a sample. And so I think that's what's missing from a lot of people's music if they don't have that. You don't even think you have to have musicality. I think a lot of people aren't even necessarily like play a lot of notes musical, but they know like how to get what they want out of something, you know? And so that's kind of what we're teaching is like how to make things special, yeah. you know? And then after that, how to network, how to get along with people, how to uh, get in the rooms, how to stay in the rooms. And a lot of it's like the business aspect too. We talk a lot about the business and kind of just period, I think a lot of people getting taken advantage of because it's an uneven playing field. You have the majors and all the lawyers and everybody they have that know all of traditional music history and all of the lawyerly things and contracts and all that. And you have you coming into music, just loving music that would pretty much do it for free. And they're going to take advantage of you and get you to do it for free. If you don't understand these things, you know, like I didn't realize as soon as I give away the stems to a track, 
the, the tracked out beat, I've given away the power. Yep. You know, I can't really negotiate. I can't really do things. I've given the stems away. I can try to fight. I can try to do things, but they have the beat. They can make it sound as good as they want and they can really do what they want to do. I can hire a lawyer and pay money and do this and try to go get it. But you're already behind the eight ball. So I'm trying to tell people, don't do that. You know, get some type of an agreement in place. And so we're trying to kind of give you some common sense things as far as just how to protect yourself yeah. and how to move in the industry and and just how there's different ways to make it. Some people don't need to chase placements. Some people could be like a pop and lo-fi producer just dropping 30 instrumentals a month on Spotify. There's a million different ways to do it. You could want to score a film or do that stuff. And so we've been lucky enough to like do sound design for the 19, uh, was it 1942? The movie trailer? Okay, the, um, yeah. yeah the, the war movie. Uh, we did sound design for that and um, the Justice League. We did sound design in those movie oh, trailers. Nice. And then we did a record on the Superfly soundtrack with Sleepy Brown, and that was in the movie. And so we've been able to get a bunch of different like sync placements and stuff like that. So I'm kind of sharing the knowledge of how you can get placements and get your stuff out there, because that's what everybody wants to know. Oh, how do you absolutely. make dope music? How do you how get do you it get to people? It. Yeah, and how do you get paid for it exactly and not get it taken from you? You know. Yeah, so I think we're just kind of given like I wanted to do like a well-rounded course to help people who maybe didn't know anything and people that have been in for a while want to get re-inspired a little bit of something for everybody you know yeah definitely and l has this type of course ever been offered at the university before nah and at the, at the u of i university of illinois at urbana champaign we're moving into a new direction right and that was one of the reasons i was able to get the job because i spent four years down here in atlanta yeah. like i said i used to work for producer grind i worked for willpower i worked for i standard and so they knew that I was moving around in the industry for real. And they got so many students coming in, like starting to turn down their offers because they want to go, how do I get on? How do I get into the industry? And after spending four years down here, because you know, you know, you come down thinking like, I'm going to go down, I'm going to get on. And you realize it's like a process, right? And so then I started meeting people. We have a lot of kids that come from Chicago. A lot of them want to be artists, but the parents are like, yo, you got to go to school. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, I thought in my mind, how can I build a pipeline? between Atlanta and the University of Illinois. And so I had this relationship with DJ Burn One from working at Producer Grind. We interviewed him, you know what I'm saying? And Four years ago. That was a minute ago. That was Four a years ago. ago, bro. He just reminded me. I was like, that's the last time we physically saw each other. And we tried, because oh, wow. we tried to link while I was still here, you know what I'm saying? It just didn't quite work out. And then when I saw this opportunity, I was like, yo, we need to bring that masterclass to, to the school, you know what I'm saying? Because like, like we just talking about um, New Music Mondays, right? Mm -hmm. Which, you know, I think y'all have a hand in that, right? No, we don't. Uh, oh, you don't? Okay, I'm, well, I don't know, whatever, but. Coalition DJs. Coalition yeah, DJs, yeah. okay. But New Music Mondays, even with that, like once I saw that, I was like, yo, this is, I watched um, Erica Banks get on, I watched, what's a, uh, what's a boy that had throat, throat baby? Oh, BRS Cash? Yeah, BRS Cash. And so I'm watching these people really come, do their song and then watch them kind of start to like move. And I'm saying, how can I get my students from, all right, this is how you record good records, this is how you make good beats, this is how you write a good song, this is how you engineer that song then this is how you take that and go network and go poly and then turn it into a career, you know what I mean? And so we call it monetization because here's what we do have a lot of, coming back to making your own samples, right? We have a ton of musicians, like real musicians, right? And the jobs they've traditionally been trying to get, those jobs are going away. And so I'm going to violin players and flute players and piano players going, yo, you need to make a sound kick, get it to track, you need to get the DJ burn one, you need to get the piano. Like, because trying to let them know that there's a market for like this real music, you know what I'm saying? Don't worry about going to perform at this orchestra group in, in New York or LA or whatever. Like put out a sound pack, you know what I'm saying? So and so just letting them know that there's other ways to monetize your music besides just playing at Carnegie Hall, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's super dope. So do do students have to be enrolled at the university to get the class? So basically, if you're not enrolled, go to DJ Burn one, you okay. know what I'm saying? Because then you got access to the full master class. But if you're enrolled at the university, you get three extra classes, you know what oh, I'm nice. saying? And not only that, we're going to bring Burn one um, to campus in April. He's going to do a beat battle, you know what I mean? One of the other things we do is we work with a lot of music teachers, right? Because the thought is, all right, if you can learn how to do a trumpet in K-12, why can't you learn how to make beats in a dog? But you need teachers that know how to use them. So we get a lot of like master students who are music teachers and we teach them how to use dogs, you know what I'm saying? So um, it's kind of like a full circle, just creating an ecosystem where now I can in my mind's eye say I want to be an artist, go tell my parents, yo, there's a program that I can go do in college. I could become an artist, monetize, and get a degree. Now that's super important right there. Yeah. So I know this is just the beginning. You guys have some other plans together, some more courses you'd like to start going to? Bro, yes, absolutely, man. Well, one thing that we did start was a music review. So oh, like yeah. every other Tuesday, we do an online music review for like an hour. 
And so, because the first thing that I started off in the master class talking about was doing an assessment. Pretty much like one of the things is giving yourself a batting average. Like out of your last 10 ideas, how many are dope, you know? Ted Williams is four out of 10 and he's a legend, bro. You know, he's in the hall of fame, but it's like, you know, trying to figure out like how good are you? And he was saying like a lot of people don't have like a good barometer. You know, like me, I was around people. I'm a DJ. I was able to just play people beats. You know, if you're in wherever, you know, you may not have somebody that you can play or trust or, you know, like if you haven't gotten an outside opinion from somebody that's not your family or a friend that says your music's dope, you don't really know how good it is really yet. Yeah. You know, and so the music review was kind of our way of, of just kind of giving people that. And then we'll give them some like constructive criticism. Mm -hmm. And do it without charging them too. Cause that's yeah. the other thing. I'm getting to me. Everybody, everyone always, wants to charge. Yeah, yeah like to get critiqued on their song. That's nuts. And then they'll give you like a one-word answer. It was yeah. cool. Yeah, and he he brought it up. He was like, "We could charge for it." I was like, mm, "I don't, you know, like I don't really care for that. You know, like this is something that I feel like I've already met a bunch of dope artists and producers that I'm following and stuff from there. I'm like, we don't need money from this. You know, we can just take an hour, listen to people's music, help try to point them in the right direction. Yeah. You know, so is this on IG Live? How can people mm -hmm. yeah, tap just it? Yeah, IG Live. Okay. Yeah, IG Live, man. Just tune in on his um, at DJ Burn One or at the letter L Beats, man. So yeah. Hell yeah. So we're looking to take this options masterclass definitely to other colleges. I definitely have some other colleges interested. And then I'm actually about to start coming out with more masterclasses from other producers, musicians, oh, nice. engineers, because I have just from this network that I've built to so many legends, I don't want to say any names or anything, but just so many dope people that have so much more to offer. So it's almost like this is like the first class that's like extremely well-rounded and full. And then we're going to have other ones that are more specific and targeted more for, um, you know, maybe like a legendary producer, a legendary musician, modern day musician, you know, kind of like going through, going through that. And cause there's so much, that's kind of why I kept hitting. I would talk and I'm like, bro, I could go so deep on this one yeah. subject. I can go, a whole, I could do a whole master class on just sampling, right? Mm -hmm. Just on that. And so that's kind of what my thought is. Some of these other producers can go more on depth on why they picked the sound out of a record or whatever it is, you know, just cause like my master class, we're going from soup to nuts, bro. You know, we're going from <laughs> making the idea, what is dope music? What is that? All the way to mixing, mastering. Like, bro, I give all my mixing secrets away. All the stuff that I've learned, all the stuff that I've trial and aired, I'm giving it all away. Like I said, I'm not really trying to like freelance and you know, I'm not really competing with nobody. So I'm like, here, I'm like, I'm giving it to you. You run with it now, you know? You run with it. I'm putting out my own music, bro. You know, like, y'all run with it and, and make it happen, bro. So I just want to share this knowledge. And, bro, I'm just excited to see people learn from it. You know, like you said, we're already seeing some people getting results and stuff. So it's like, bro, like, imagine if all the colleges had adult music yeah, and they weren't, because I think a lot of people, you know, specific, everybody's got their different things. Like, some people that really know how to play instruments don't compose. Like you can play Bach, you can play all this and you don't like if I said play me something in E minor and they're like, what? You know, like I literally worked with, <laughs> with somebody one time and I was like, she, bro, she plays piano so dope. And I was like, play me something. She was like, what? I was like, play me something in E minor. Yeah. And she was like, what? And I was like, why do I have to keep saying what? You know, and I was like, I don't know. And she was like, well, I don't know what. She wouldn't even put her hands on the keyboard. You know, I've heard her say some, play some of the most amazing piano. And so I was like, I don't want to be that person. And I want to help people not hit that rut of what to play. Put your hands down and play something. Like I was saying, the producer I was working with, yeah. I was teaching him how to sample right there in the consultation. Like that was what he needed. You know, I was like, bro, you're going to sample yourself. So I had him just play for five minutes. And he was like, again, play what? And I was like, just play anything. Put your hands, play all white keys. It doesn't matter, bro. All black keys. Just pick one or the other and go. And he's like, the first two minutes, he was like a little baby lamb playing, you know, like trying to walk for the first time. And I think after you, five minutes, he really got into it. I think you just keyed in on some shit, though, because like a lot of people, like they don't know what the, you know what I'm saying, like that first step is. You don't know they saying? don't. Yeah, they don't like, know how do I go from and, reading, and, writing, and learning to yeah. doing my thing. And, and everybody needs some different shit too. Because you got to meet people where they are. You know what I'm saying? Some people have had experience doing shows. Some people have had a feature even or been in a studio with somebody big, but they don't know. All right, if I look at my whole situation, what do I need to take my next step? Some people, I'm getting them signed up with their PROs, you know what I'm saying? Some people, we're linking them with, you think about how many people we like, was linking with artists, okay, you should go rock with this guy. Hey, send us some more music, you know what I'm saying, so. Yeah, yeah that's dope right there. Yeah. yeah, it's really cool, bro. Yeah. All right, do you guys have any shout outs you'd like to give before we wrap it up here? 
Man, uh, shout out to the University of Illinois for taking this <laughs> class in with us, bro. Because it's crazy that they just took a chance on us. And shout out to my boy Letter LBs for taking the chance and really like being the bridge. Because this is what I was talking. I was talking to when I was talking to KLC the other night. I was like, if not for him, there is no bridge to to make the class even happen. And so I feel like this is the opportunity to, like I said, really help people learn how to produce and really just make the most of being a musician in the modern day age. I feel like everything was talking like historical before this class, you know, and we're looking now and forward, you know, we're still like learning from the past, but not just stuck in it. And so shout out to the class, shout out to everything that's going on right now. You know, like it's, I just want to share knowledge and help people grow, honestly, you know, I don't know if you got any shout outs. Shout out University of Illinois. I mean, really one of my goals when I got this job was to build a bridge from Atlanta back to Champaign because I knew that was how I learned the music industry. So I just appreciate you, you know what I'm saying, providing that opportunity for me and for us, man. Thank you. Oh uh, yeah, absolutely. And so I got a promo code DGB50. Get okay. You, hey. Get you 50 off the, uh, the master class. We got the pre-order up right now. You can get it half off. And then I think in a month it'll be out available to the public. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that's dope. Right it's there. exciting, man. It's cool times, bro. I'm excited to be able to share all the stuff that I've learned because I honestly have so many conversations nerding out with people <laughs> over music. And I'm like, you know, kind of the same thing. Like nobody's around to hear this. And then also, does anybody want to hear it? And then you realize, oh, a lot of people want to hear about this. And there's so many different aspects of music. There's not just one thing. Remember the kid that played the beat and you were like, yo, I was just working with that same sample. Oh, yeah. This absolutely. kid plays the beat and then Burn One turns around and plays the same sample. It was like, yo, that's. And then it was like, this is how you do it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, <laughs> yeah man. Nah, it's dope, man. It's super dope. So, yeah, uh, www.d5pointsbakery.com. You can find us there at DJ Burn One. At the letter L Beats, T H E L E T T R L Beats with an S. Absolutely. I got a new single coming out with uh, John William and Fabo, Brandon Red Lights. Hey. That's coming out, yep. And a new single with Daniel Payne and Duke Deuce. Oh, That's wow. super hard. Oh, That's bro. That's going to be dope. It's fire, that. bro. Both of them are so dope, man. I'm excited. I actually shot the Fabo video. I shoot videos and do all that stuff, yep. too. Like, I've been doing that. I shot like six videos for B.O.B. a couple years ago. Yep. Um, and so last year we had Night Drive from John William that was playing all year in rotation. So that was pretty dope, man. Sweet. Yeah, man. Let me know, know what's up, before I grow, grow enough. Yeah.